Okay, Andy, we're recording. Okay, I'm going to uh, call the Finance Committee meeting of May 18, 2021 to order at three minutes after 1 p.m. And this uh, meeting is being held virtually pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 uh, laws, Chapter 30A, Section 18. And uh, because we are having this Finance Committee by remote participation, I need to check with each member of the committee and um, have them confirm that they can hear me and be heard. So, uh, Kathy Shane? Yes, here. Uh, Lynn Guzman? Present. Kathy Angelus? Present. Uh, Dorothy Pam? I don't think she's hearing us. Yeah, she also, her picture's frozen on my screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll give her a call and see if I can. Yeah, oh, here she's oh, back. Dorothy. Oh. Dorothy, can you hear? I, I'm here. Okay. I hear you. you. We hear you. You're, except I'm you're, on the set. you're freezing yeah. periodically. You might be a little too far from the, the Wi Fi. Uh, did, Bob Hegner. I'll be back. I'm here. And Bernie Kubiak. <laughs> You're here, right? Mm -hmm. And Jane Chapler. I'm here. Okay, great. So we just need to solve the problem with Dorothy Pam. And um, the um, agenda today is to um, review the budget um, of the public works and the enterprise funds. And uh, because we have two people who are here who are, uh, work with the uh, transportation enterprise fund, um, we'll start with that. And uh, I'll first ask Sean if he has anything introductory to say regarding the enterprise fund before we yeah, so um, thank you, Andy. Um, so transport the Transportation Enterprise Fund is probably the hardest hit of all the enterprise funds from the pandemic. Um, when you look at the budget, you'll see a pretty big reduction in the spending plan. Um, and that's mostly being made up through uh, reducing the indirect charge that it pays to the general fund. So really the general fund is sort of taking the hit because of the, the struggles in the transportation fund. Um, so, so we're looking at that really closely. That's, this is an area we, you know, we anticipate will improve when the college students come back and, and downtown returns to normal a little bit. Um, but we are really, you know, we have a high awareness to the, the need to get revenues up in this fund. Um, and we, we did get a number of questions from uh, Mr. Hegner on the transportation fund. So if I can bring those, I don't know, I, he, he sent them in a format where I could actually probably just share my screen. We put our our um, responses in, and if that's easiest, maybe I just share my screen and kind of go through them for transportation. Is, is that okay with you? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Do you see? Um, do you see the questions on the screen? Yes. And they're uh, are they large enough to um, read? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the, uh, the first question, and I'll probably just ask people to jump in and kind of expand on this a little bit. Um, the first question was at a time when the number of existing parking spaces may actually be reduced, where would additional parking spaces be located? And I'd probably look to Guilford to weigh in on any thoughts he might have on this. I know there's talk of a parking garage at some point in the future, um, but Guilford's probably got the best perspective on where there might be additional parking. We can't hear you, Guilford. You're too far away, wherever wherever you are in your background. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. The Zoom and the the Zoom and Teams doesn't work well sometimes. 
So uh, we're looking at mostly building or adding parking on existing roads. Um, there's not very many other places to put it except in a parking garage. So um, we've kind of been trying to figure in spaces wherever we could along the roadways. Thanks, Gilford. And, and one of the other things we're doing um, as sort of a team is, is taking the uh, report from the consultant that I think was a couple of years ago or maybe just last year. Um, and one of the major pieces there was around signage and making sure it's really clear all the lots that are available for, for public parking. And, and that may also maybe not add parking, but make it feel like there's more parking if people can easily find the different lots around town. Um, so that's something we're gonna be working on quite a bit this summer. And then the second question is at a time when building permits are being issued for mixed use facilities with inadequate parking and much uh, and more such facilities are being planned, the issue of a parking garage and how it will be funded needs to be a priority. Um, and again, I think that's something that's a, a constant thing we're, we're looking at and, and monitoring. Um, we are also as part of one of the recommendations from the consultants report was to look at our permit program and so that's another thing we're looking at, uh, Jen and I, and some of the others that were involved in the in the parking group, um, are going to be looking at our permit system and making sure, you know, it's in a good place for the next five years, uh, given some of the changes to downtown. So two hands are up, um, and I'll ask uh, first Kathy and then Lynn some question. Are you? Um, asking questions along the topics that were in the first set of questions, which were the uh, challenges long range objectives. Kathy? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just gonna focus on following up on parking. Um, so a question I've had for a while. So as you, um, Sean, you've said a few times, you're re-looking at parking policies. If you go down into the Boltwood garage, um, that is our public space, we have reserve spots, which are about half, not quite half the garage. And I know people pay a fixed fee for that. What I have observed um, is those are often vacant while the rest of the underground lot is full. And that includes on night times and on weekends where they could be used. So could we revisit whether you, when you buy a, slot, a reserve slot, could they be just from like nine to five and free it up on weekends and evenings? Um, Cause you could actually be towed if you park in those um, cause someone has taken them up and maybe alter the fee. But it's, I have the count in a memo I've done but it, it feels like a lot of spaces and it's, um, conveniently located and we spent money to build it. So I've wondered about that long-term rental with empty spaces. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm gonna to turn to Jen. I think some of those spots are dedicated spots. So that's why they, you may see them vacant because I think they pay more for them to be dedicated. But Jen, you, you'll, you'll know that better than I. Um, yes, I believe there's 27 or 29 reserve spaces. And the way it's set up now is 24 seven, it's a thousand dollars a year. Um, I think it would, this was also one of the items that the consultant touched on to, for us to take a look at. Um, yeah, I just wanna say, I knew that people were paying that and I raised it when the consultant was, but to me, we don't have to give 24 seven. We could give, you know, if we're doing it for people who are workers downtown, so they're out, it could be eight to five. And then to the extent you wanna park there at night, you like everybody else. So I'm just wondering about the policy. And then does that mean it's not, not, not a thousand, is it a 900? But um, it's a prime location. If you go down there on weekends, more than half often of those 27 spaces are empty. Okay. And that's true in the summer as well. So I think it may be seasonal, you know, people who are student, you know, people who are in town when the university is in session. So it doesn't appear to be just workforce that are renting those. Um, okay, no, when we look at the, that's definitely something we'll, we'll take a note of and we'll look at. Um, again, we're gonna be looking at this pretty closely in the um, June and July. It's sort of our summer project is to, to see what we can do on that front. So we'll make note of that. Yeah, um, I'll go on to Lynn, uh, but uh, uh, one observation on that and the question is whether any of those rentals go are by people who are downtown residents in one of the adjoining buildings. Um, but, yeah, I know I know at least one example of where it is. So I think that's, 
again, part, I think from their perspective, it might be, they want that spot. So that when they come home, they have a, you know, a place to park. Um, but that's just one example, um, one specific example I'm aware of. Lynn? Uh, my question is in the same area. And it's really, as you're taking this look, are you looking at what we really should be charging for these spots? Because frankly, that seems cheap. Yeah, no, I think that's that's one of the major objectives is we're going to be looking, uh, we've already started this a little bit, we've reached out to Northampton to see what they, you know, what they're doing for parking, not that we have to follow Northampton, but um, they have a pretty robust parking uh, program as well. So yeah, no, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at is are the fees at the right level? Um, you know, is it, are the incent is it structured in a way that it's sort of incentivizing what we, we would want it to incentivize? Um, and so that'll all be part of it. Okay, Kathy and Lynn, there's both of your hands up. I didn't know. Yeah, well, yeah. The, I have the same question. I know you're going to be looking at permits too, but I looked at the permits and I just, I'll just, I send you my memo, Sean, and I collected what does UMass charge for its various slots, starting with the cheapest slot um, compared to what we charge for a permit. And so the thought is, could we have a two tiered permit policy if you work downtown and if you're senior citizen living downtown and or in an affordable housing, you get one rate, it's $25 now. And if you're not, the rate is a lot hot, nearer to what a UMass remote lot would be. Um, and then secondly, I asked this of Paul and he confirmed you do not have to have your car registered in Amherst or your plates registered in Amherst. You can still get a parking permit. Should we do that? Should we instead say, if you want a permit to park on our streets, you've got to register your car in Amherst um, and plate. I mean, that's revenue for us on the plate side. So it's just, it's uh, we streets are expensive um, and those part. So trying to think of a differential policy around permits um, as we as we move forward so yeah no, absolutely are there any other questions or do you want me to move on to the next one yeah why don't you go ahead or dorothy i think dorothy's got her hand I, raised i'm sorry I, I thought i had my hand up but i moved my computer and it hopped down so just following up on what kathy's saying um differential um permits for different people um, and I do think the idea of, are you a taxpayer? Is your car registered? Are you paying the car fee? I think that's relevant. Uh, but this is a, a question. Um, on Amity Street, there are a number of, of uh, permits. And uh, before I got, became a member of town council, I had just assumed that those were for people who actually lived in those buildings. Some of those buildings on the um, south side of Amity uh, are rather densely populated. So I had assumed that it was parking for people who lived there, but for whom there was no parking in, you know, room in the driveway. Um, it was only when I laid, later found out it was just any random person that walked into town hall and paid $25, got one, that I, I began to uh, have great questions about the whole permit system. Um, it's just set up for people to take advantage. Um, and I, I agree that if someone is a UMass student, could park on UMass lots, that that's where they should park and not on the streets of Amherst. Um, but I think it comes down to the fact that I disagree totally with the policy that said, we don't need parking downtown because there's a bus. Cause I cannot in any way make that make logical sense for me. I, I see it as a kind of mantra, but I don't see it as rational. Well, I'm uh... Okay. We, so need to, we need to think about these things, but I'm, uh, in the end, I want to try and stay focused on the budget side to the extent possible. Uh, yeah. And I think our goal, just, you know, the transportation fund with, the, you know, some of the weaknesses of the transportation fund were sort of exposed by the pandemic, um, that it wasn't in a very strong place pre-pandemic. And so when the pandemic hit, again, it just kind of exposed that. And so, you know, our goal is, not only to get back where we were prior to the pandemic, but how do we start to build a balance and start to build a reserve and be able to um, build funding to make improvements within the transportation fund. Um, and so that'll be part of what we keep in mind when we, you know, we look at all this and, and think about changes for the future. 
and, are, and, I, yeah. and, I, and Sean, these, Andy, I think these ideas are all revenue producing too. So it wasn't just a focus. I mean, I think these are potential revenue sources. So, yeah. No, I think I, think I agree that to, to an extent they are, but I'm just trying to yeah. um, separate out the right. pieces where they're not. Um, so I just want to add. With, with, well, let's go on with the questions because we've got um, three or more enterprise funds and the entire department in the time limit. So. Okay, um, so the next question is, um, is, is this, uh, so the collection rates um, were between 70 and 79%. Um, and the question was, is this due to the appeals or failure to pay parking fines? How much revenue is lost and our failure to pay, is the failure to pay largely from out of town state license plates? Um, Jen, do you wanna weigh in on that one? Sure. So um, there wasn't as many ticket appeals during the pandemic because there was not as many tickets written. Um, but as the hearings officer, if it's a first time ticket and they're appealing it, it I tend to be a little more favorable to them to entice them to come back to Amherst. I don't want to leave a bad taste in their mouth. Um, and as far as the what was the other question? Failure to pay. Um, there's really a mix of mass plates and out-of-state plates. We do have a boot policy for any plates that have five or more late tickets. Um, but again, this was suspended at the beginning of the pandemic with the state of the emergency that was issued. So we, we've not yet resumed the booting policy. And then the next question, and this may also be you, Jen. Um, annual meter uh, revenue per space ranges from $179 with a lower Boltwood garage to $1,686 for Main Street and, and $1,691 for Amity Street lot. Um, can you provide a brief summary of why the differences exist and how much revenue could be realized if all the spaces were fully utilized um, and what is being done to try to increase the utilization of existing parking spots? Um, so. I don't, I don't know if we have the numbers of what's sort of the max per lot. I don't know, Jen, if you have that, if, if, you know, if they were all utilized fully all day long. But um, again, the, the main, one of the main strategies we're gonna work on this summer is the signage and, and making sure that all the public lots, you know, you can be guided to, or there's some way to indicate where those public lots are. So if one is full, um, it won't be hard, difficult to find another one and, and utilize some of those lots that maybe have been less utilized in the past. Um, but Jen, do you have any thoughts on the, I assume it's just related to the permits and the, and the, and the fee structure for those different lots is why there's differences and, and how much, uh, how close to the center of town they are. But do you have thoughts on that? Right, so the lower level of the garage, the Spring Street lot and the CVS lot are all 50 cents an hour where the other lots are a dollar an hour. And the Spring, all three of those lots are also, um, eight to six as opposed to eight to eight. So that would take into account a little bit of a little bit of the difference as well. Bob Eggner? Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up with, uh, you know, first of all, there's a typo there. It's 197 at Lower Boltwood. I, I apologize for that. But um, it does seem like, you know, given what Kathy had just said before about how spaces in Lower Boltwood are kind of at a premium, I would expect that those would be um, you more fully utilized than they appear to be. So um, I, I do encourage you all to try to figure out, you know, how do we get people to use the parking spaces that are there right now? Yeah. yeah, building on what uh, Bob just said, which was part of what I was going to, if it, uh, uh, revenue is potentially $1,686 for a parking space, uh, you know, just with turnover, why are, is our permit or our dedicated space only $1,000? Why aren't we charging full freight for that ongoing reservation if we're not going to limit it? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of background into why the permit rates are what they currently are. Um, 
again, I assume the rates are a little bit lower, maybe to incentivize and sort of lock it in and, and you're kind of guaranteeing that money. Um, but I'm not sure, Jen, do you have any background on when, when the last time rates were updated? I want to say I want to say it was probably five or six years ago. It went from eight hundred and fifty, I believe, to a thousand dollars. Okay. So. But again, that is definitely one of the things we'll be looking at. Um, we've already started looking at, but we're going to continue to look at over the summer is um, some of those rationales. Kathy. I'm unmuting. Um, the 1,686, is that the North Commons lot? That's that high return. So one of, one of the things I think we just heard is the hours at which you have to pay a fee are longer. So it goes off at a different time at night. Um, I park at Boltwood Underground because I can park there starting at six o'clock. So I can put my 50 cents in and be there for a town council meeting. But um, in terms of equalizing or not equalizing them, and that I think is something maybe to look at. And my other question is that underground garage, people have said, oh God, I would never park there. Can we get better motion center sensitive lights there that even run off solar like I have out in my barn? Um, because it's people may not want to be there at night because it's dark. So just something that makes it a more hospitable place to put your car down and walk around. That's, yeah. that's yeah, just that, a question, yeah. That was one of the recommendations in the report too, was just looking at our parking and, and the lighting and, um, and what may deter somebody from parking in a, a given lot if, they're, you know, if there isn't good lighting. So that will be, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I might just comment on the 197, Bob, on Lower Boatwood Garage. Those spaces are full at night. It's just, you can't park in the, you know, so Pat, part of it, I think is it goes off at six o'clock is yeah. why it's lower. But I often try there before I start driving around streets. Um, so I think it's that there aren't that many spaces and they're full because <laughs> um, it, it's cheap to park there and you can not pay after six o'clock. Yeah. yeah, but that sort of begs the question as to why the meter revenue per space is so low. But maybe that's the, the price, you know, the cost. Yeah, well, 50, 50 cents versus a dollar. So that's, I, I just, you know, it's just my sense is how many hours is the space available? And then if you only, if you're paying half as much for it, it's fewer hours at a yeah. cheaper rate. Um, yeah. But I have no idea if that's, are they always full or not? I, do, I don't know. Um, right. And we'll double check that number and just make, um, you know, the one thing I could see is did we, and Jen probably knows this, uh, when we divide it by the number of spaces, are we only dividing it by the spaces with meters? Or are we including the permit spaces as well? Because that would that would bring it down quite a bit if we were including the non-meter spaces. Yeah, that could be, that could be but, it. But we'll double check that. Yeah, I, I think, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I think that the purpose of this question was to generate this kind of discussion and I think it's been successful in that. <clears throat> um, Dorothy, you're, you're him. Uh, yes, I'd like to speak on the um, garage. Uh, I have never ever entered it. Uh, when I asked somebody about it, they told me there was never any spaces. Um, but it turns out Kathy who uses it says, yes, there are often spaces. So some parking garages have a sign outside, an electronic sign that tells you how many empty parking spaces there are. And I mean, this was built with public money and you know, a lot of the public isn't using it because of perception, which may or may not be true, that there's no parking spaces available. So I, I would recommend getting, when I don't know whether that means it has to be staffed, but um, thinking about how can this public amenity be more open and user-friendly for the public? And I agree with Kathy, lights would be good, but if you had a sign, electronic sign saying that there were five or 10 parking places available, then you would go in and try it. No, it's funny you say that, Dorothy, because that's a technology that I looked at a, into a little bit and got a quote. It's pretty expensive, um, depending on the technology, but I think it was um, the Natick, uh, what's, is it the Natick Mall has that technology now in their in their garages, so you don't have to turn down a, you know, a, a way unless you see that there's spots available. It's really nice. Um, you know, we'd probably have to see how it uh, interacted with the potential surveillance bylaw 
um, because the technology, they, they post something up on like a light pole and it shoots down at the spots mm -hmm. um, and it can tell if there's an empty spot and then it sends that signal to like a, some sort of board that tells you how many spots are available. Um, but that's an example of the kind of thing where if we can get to a place where the transportation fund is making more money, that potentially that could be done with some lots in the future. Because I agree that it would be nice to not even pull into a lot if there's no spots um, downtown. I think that would help out a lot. Yeah, and, and, and airports, I've seen some of them where they actually tell you the number of the open space yep. on each level. Yep. And then it's a question that uh, we'll have to figure out the cost of that. I one one question if Captain Ting is uh, um, available to answer or has an answer, and that is whether there are any problems with the lower level of the garage that require um, attention and might in, um, be keeping people from feeling comfortable going there for parking. Yeah, the, my, my only response to that, Andy, is that, you know, at times, you know, certainly during the uh, winter uh, months, at times, uh, some of the homeless population will, will camp down there. And uh, we do regularly monitor it. However, you know, we are reluctant to just kick them out necessarily if it's uh, a really cold day so we do try to find them shelter if that's possible but at the same time i do recognize that uh that could be a, a possible deterrent for some people to utilize the garage okay thank you um, sean you want to continue on yeah because we I do want to i think we only have one more um two more transportation questions um that uh pre-sent questions um, so this next one is about the number of parking permits that it increased significantly from FY16 to FY19, but declined in FY20. What is the expected number for 21 and how much of the increase is due to new development downtown and how much is, uh, how much of the decrease is due to COVID-19? Um, Jen, do you want to answer that one? Sure. So there was two mixed build, mixed use buildings that happened in the last four or five years. Um, and that definitely put more people in town that were eligible for a permit. Um, so that that was the result of the increase. And the pandemic really did a number on FY20 and gave us less permits than what we had planned on having. Right. And I don't think we really know for FY21. Um, uh, well, actually, we do we do. You, I think that's a number we can get to the FY21 number. I think we can get you an update on where that's at. Um, I don't. You don't have have that um, off the top of your head, do you, Jen? I don't, but I can. I can get it for you. Yeah. We can add that to this question packet before we post it. Um, the FY the number of permits for FY21. Okay. So that um, does the questions. Uh, I'm sorry, there was one final one that was sent okay. after, and that was, um, please explain the, um, explain the difference between parking violations and parking fines. And the difference is that parking violations are the actual fee issued, and parking fines are the local um, late fine assessed after 21 days if it's um, a, a violent violation issuance. So that's if it's late, right, Jen? Yes, okay. correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I had uh, just one observation, and this goes to all of the enterprise funds, uh, Sean, mm -hmm. but I'll uh, ask it in terms of what's on top of page 228 of the budget book, which is transportation, since that's the fund we're on. The um, number that we have in the FY22 column is the original manager budget? Yes. Or is that a, re a revised number? Um, for 22? No, I mean for 21, I'm sorry. Um, for 21, it would be, um, on the revenue side, it would be the recap, which, uh, Sonia, I don't know if 21 changed at all for transportation. Did the recap change the transportation revenue line? Um, what, what page are you looking at? So we're looking at the um, page 228. It mm -hmm. has the revenues on top and the expenses on the bottom. 
And the question is whether the FY21 column um, on the expenditure side, we know that that's the, um, the budget, but on the revenue side, is that the recap? Yeah, that's the final figure that went into the recap. Chris, we don't have the last quarter in. I was just um, no. The, so the recap is, you know, that's the the estimate that we have when the tax rate is set based on how things are. Oh, going. okay. So, yeah. So that. So yeah, it's not, not the. It's not. So when we get so to the project. actual, the number will be significantly less. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we get to, and you'll see the third quarter budget report pretty soon. Um, we're going to send it to you on Monday. Actually, the third quarter budget report. Transportation's coming in quite a bit less, even lower than what we thought. Because I think that uh, we just have to be aware of it when we're looking at the figure to know what that number is. And that was the original budget, not the actual. And the actual is substantially different. And uh, the change then, uh, when you go to 694, it's against a figure that doesn't make any sense because it's not actually you know, it, it was done before there was a change of circumstances. Yeah, no, I mean, when you, so the, the 694, I believe, is actually a little bit of an increase from where we think we are going to end up for actuals for FY21, and, and you'll see that in the, the Q3 report. But yeah, when, at the time we do this, you know, we always base it on sort of what was the last official estimate of the of the revenues for the year. I can tell you through the third quarter, we've taken in about $486,000. So it's significantly less. Yeah. So 694 would be a presumption that we're, we will be on our way to recovery, yeah. but not fully back to what we had had in some previous years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you... so Sean, can I just clarify something? The number in the budget book is the actual budget before we set the recap. So when you set the recap, there's always some tweaking of revenues to make it balance. So the recap's actually 838 to 22. Yeah, no, that, that's what's in the, um, that's what's in the budget. Yeah. yeah, that's from the projection. Just in case somebody notices it's different when they see the third quarter report. Mm -hmm. So there's does everyone understand what the question was about here? Yeah. Okay. Sonia, do you want to, should we do a quick, a really two second explanation of the recap versus the, the original budget, Andy, just to, in case. Yeah, go ahead. Saying. Okay. Sonia, do you want to just give that quick? Uh... So basically what it is, is revenues when we're estimating our revenues and our projections, they are truly estimated until our budget is set. And once we set the, once we appropriate the operating expenditure side, whatever you vote, that's law. That's the amount of money we're we're budgeting for. But the revenues are still in flux until we actually set the tax rate, because the tax rate is a huge calculation that goes out and rounds numbers and everything. So and it has to balance. So sometimes we have to tweak the numbers, you know, up or down a hundred thousand, like. Our local receipts are normally what we state aid is usually what it is. Once the tax rate is calculated, we can only get so much out of the tax rate. So the only thing we can balance with is local receipts. So we can move local receipts up and down until we, once it's on the tax recap and they approve our tax rate, those estimated receipts are still estimated receipts, but they're written in stone at that part. You can't say we're gonna get another $100,000. So let's add another $100,000 and spend it here. It stops right there. Right, so the so the expense budget is locked in place when you vote the budget in June. The mm -hmm. revenue budget still shifts around a little bit up until the tax rate is set in and usually December, right? Right, right. Which is why you can only appropriate from free cash or existing available funds once the tax rate is set. The enterprise funds are separate beasts. We can't move from the enterprise fund to the general fund other than the amount that we're charging for indirect costs. I, 
having a little trouble figuring out why recap works um, is a help for us. Well, the um, sewer fund is also part of the recap. So once the numbers are set completely, still the numbers in the recap. The recap is kind of like the last moment. Once the recap is set, you can't say we're going to estimate more revenues in the year or say we're going to get taken an extra, like I said, an extra hundred thousand dollar in water rates and we can't take that and appropriate it in the same year. That's why you have retained earnings just like free cash in the sewer in the sewer fund. Okay. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, I just want to make sure so that if I look on page 230, uh, at that revenue detail, it's the same issue. The FY21 um, is what the budget was set at, even and even, it does not reflect actuals. No, yeah. So if, if you look at um, the FY21 column for transportation, the 838-222, that's the same as what we had we had project the budgeted on that amount for FY21. Right. If you go to okay. page 261 of last year's. Andy, thanks for asking that question because I really was having a difficult time understanding the negatives shown here for FY22. Thanks. So other questions and then uh, Sean, do we want to- uh, Do we want to go? To yeah, if there's no other um, transportation questions, we can- Well, we, before we- uh, because uh, we don't want to hold Captain Thing longer than necessary. Is there, um, I think the one thing that, uh, of course, you, that you play a very important function, as I understand, is that you're supervising the uh, parking officers. And uh, we've had, uh, we, we re Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we reassigned the staff and we're able to move some of the expense of them over to uh, one-time funds. Yeah, so earlier in the year, um, they're, they're all back now, but earlier in the year, we, um, we reassigned some of the parking staff, um, both the, the parking enforcement officers, but also um, we had some parking staff in the finance office as well and in, in the collector's office. Um, that were reassigned to do, whether it be the um, Puffer's Pond and trying to uh, serve as an ambassador role at Puffer's Pond. Um, they also helped out at Cherry Hill so that um, Cherry Hill didn't have to hire additional staff um, for certain periods of time. Um, but all of that's gone back to, that, that was for a certain period of time really over last summer uh, where that happened. So does anyone have any questions in the operation or enforcement side. Uh, is, do we, uh, I think we, unless, do you have anything that you want to report, uh, Gabe, or we, uh, because I think not, we appreciate Not really, like I said, just, just, uh, just to piggyback on what Sean was saying, um, you know, over the summer and throughout uh, COVID, as we kind of suspended um, enforcement of, uh, the meters, you know, we did reallocate our two park enforcement officers to other areas, you know, as well as Puffer's Pond and Cherry Hill. They were also utilized with the uh, senior center and helping out to deliver meals. Um, so, uh, again, what Sean was saying, that everything's back to normal now. And as things are starting to relax a little bit more, they are focusing solely on enforcement now. So, um, yeah. Okay, we still have a part-time position vacant, right? That's correct. So okay. right now we have two full-timers and one vacancy with the part-time positions. Right. And we've decided not to fill that sort of on a temporary basis as one of the sort of a cost-saving measure um, correct. in the fund. Correct. And, and Gabe, the other thing that might be interesting, um, you know, there is a couple capital items that we're thinking about with this fund. And I think the one that you've you've brought up that we we're looking at is the um, the handhelds that the park enforcement officers use. It's something that's we're gonna have to think about in the next, you know, near term. Yeah, you know, the, the handhelds that we currently use are, are really outdated and they're, they're kind of on its last leg. Um, been piecemealing it with the uh, with the current company that, that uh, provided them. 
well, it's getting harder to uh, to maintain because the parts are no longer really available for those particular units. And again, you know, the technology has moved so quickly where the newer uh, units that are out there and available are just far superior and would make things a lot more efficient and uh, a lot more profitable, to be honest with you. So that is something that uh, we would be interested in in uh, proposing down the line for a, a capital expense. And from your experience and uh, the reports that you're getting from the officers, is the park mobile being uh, a helpful add-on and are the, those parking boxes working well? It's extremely helpful, very helpful. They've been working out very well. Um, but again, uh, the handhelds, they, they coincide with the park mobile app. Um, and again, those are uh, struggling. So down the line, we certainly need to replace those and that would make it much easier. And just one other thing that might be interesting for you all is that we're also looking at as a potential revenue generator are the charging stations. Um, you know, we have a number of charging stations. We're looking for um, grants to put in more. And, and so, you know, we, there sort of needs to be a cost analysis of, you know, whether we're charging the right amount at those charging stations, but um, they also theoretically in the future can attract people downtown. Um, if we have these charging stations, people are supposed to pay for parking while they're charging as well. Um, and so it could be a draw to downtown if we have a number of these, um, especially if we get a, a high speed charger. We don't, I don't think we have any of the high speed ones yet, but we're, um, we put a grant application in for one and we're hopeful that we'll get it. That could be a, a draw for downtown. Okay, anything else from the committee? Because one other topic that I just want to touch on quickly related to the fund, which is different and that is uh, um, just to remind everybody that um, PBTA comes out of um, our assessment for PBTA comes out of the transportation fund. And so revenues are down on the fund to put stress on the bus system. Uh, there was the uh, report that we were, um, we read that was uh, related to the reparations uh, work that was at yesterday's council, discussed yesterday's council meeting, but the report talked a lot about PVTA. Uh, the way that PVTA is funded is so tied to the university that the criticism that was put forward and the observation that was put forward um, in that report um, we, re we really have a problem with the uh, financial side of it because of how it's paid for. And I, I think that at some point it might be worthwhile getting a better understanding of how the whole PVTA payment system works so that people can realize why we're so tied to the university schedule for PVTA. Mm -hmm. But if there's any quick questions that people have to understand that they should ask it, but otherwise I want to move on to one of the other enterprise funds. Um, Dorothy? Uh, just a, a quick statement. Understanding something is one thing, but using it's another. Um, we can understand our financing of the PVTA, but the bus system is not really reliable. It's not year round and people who need it to go to work find it lets them down. So. Um, it, it, to me, it's a kind of a more of a theory than an actual thing that people can count on. And yet we I talk actually, about really there. Yeah, actually, I'm going to be very brief on this, but that is where they tie together because if you have a system that is so dependent upon the university and the five colleges paying for a substantial portion of the uh, bus service, then there, uh, then the bus service gets tied into what the major payers um, are expecting, why they're putting that much money into it. And we don't therefore have a revenue system that is going to pay for a robust bus service system. And I think that's uh, where the two kind of collide. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, uh, Kevin King, thank you very much. Appreciate you being with us. Um, as always, you're welcome to stay. And same, um, I think uh, same to you, Jennifer. Uh, 
that um, Fontaine, we're, uh, I think we're gonna move on beyond transportation now. So um, thank you. really appreciate you being with us. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Sean, how do you wanna proceed? Do we wanna stay with enterprise funds since we're on that and then come back to DPW or? Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna go, maybe I'll just go to the, back to the beginning for enterprise funds, which would be, um, water. Mm -hmm. These are, so there was actually a list of um, sort of general questions for enterprise funds. So I'm gonna share my screen again. So the, um, some of these were just sort of comments and I'll just show you what our response was. Um, so the first one was um, about a listing of the current future balance in each enterprise fund. So what, a, what the sort of the retained earnings balance would be. Um, we do provide that for water and sewer. When we talk about rates, we do provide sort of the beginning retained earnings balance, but I don't know if you ever really see it for um, parking or, or solid waste. So that's something we can certainly add to a, a future for, to the next budget cycle is um, including sort of the fund balance to start. Yeah, the, 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 the reason for that was, you know, if we see like we're going to dip into the fund for $100,000, what's the denominator, you know? Yeah. 1%, 10%, you know, 50%, you know, I, I, it's just helpful for me. And I, I know some of this information is elsewhere, but it's helpful to just have it in one place. Right. No, and that dovetails nicely. I still want to, um, you know, we, we did a sort of a preliminary update of our financial policies. And I, I still, whenever if the finance committee ever gets a, a sort of a break in your schedule, which you've had a pretty busy schedule the last few months. But um, if you ever get a break in your schedule, there's a couple of topics I want to bring back. And one of them is to look at our financial policies and get your input on some of the updates. And one of those updates that's new is uh, a policy on reserve. We have a five to 15% for general fund reserves. Um, we put in some, our thoughts on what we think would be a good reserve range for enterprise funds and having that and then showing you um, what the amount is, you'll be able to kind of see whether we're you know, operating within the policy. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, next question was, it would be helpful to have a statement summarizing out year estimates for projects that may have a large impact on a given fund. Um, obviously Centennial may, probably comes to mind for most people because that's the big one. Um, and again, I think this is something, uh, you know, we did talk about sort of the impact of these big projects for water and sewer, uh, but it's definitely something we could um, try to expand on the, on, in, within the budget. Uh, to talk more about that. Yeah, so Sean, I was just, I, I, it, I, I don't, I wouldn't expect a detailed analysis. It's more of a heads up, mm -hmm. you know, that, hey guys, you know, this is coming down the pike and, you know, just so people un, don't forget about, not that the fi finance committee would forget about it or the council, but, you know, uh, residents may or may not have that in their heads quite as much as we do. So Sure, no, that makes sense. Um, and then the last sort of general question um, was about in the accomplishments and objectives, um, including installation, installation, replacement of infrastructure. Um, this type of work would seem to fall within the town's effort to more systematically inventory future capital expenditures. So I think, um, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is about in our capital inventory, you know, just making sure that enterprise funds are, are well represented within that capital inventory. Um, yeah, going. Sean, you're, for some reason, you're not sharing the screen anymore. I don't know. Oh, I, you know what? I dragged it over and, and I, that's what happened. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, obviously we've got sewer lines and water lines and roads and things. And, and I know that it's difficult to inventory them right now and to set up some sort of schedule for maintenance on them. But I think it would be helpful over as we develop our, our capital inventory uh, to bring in as much as we can that we know we're gonna have to spend so much money each year on water lines, on sewer lines, et cetera, so. Gilford, do you think, um, do you, you wanna mention a little bit about the program you were looking at? Cause it seems like that might um, line up nicely with the program that you're exploring for uh, managing your assets. 
Um, well, actually, you could use the program we're looking at for those assets for pipelines and hydrants and so forth. Um, we do have an inventory. We know pretty much where every water line is. We know basically the age. Some we don't have the exact age. Um, the problem with our pipe system is uh, they're kind of like our road system in that some de de deteriorate faster than others. Um, so even though we may think it's 100 years old and we may want to replace it, that's the one we want to keep and we want to replace one that's only 50 years old. Um, so it's, it's not just a simple matter of saying these are the pipes, these are the oldest ones, these get replaced first. Um, but it's something we do work on and we do have sort of a rough idea in our head what we want to replace. Um, we have different reasons for replacing it, not just age and not just the worst condition. Um, so we are working on that. We do, we do have a list of those. If we actually told you the number, the, the dollar number for that, we would knock you off your chair and everyone <laughs> would think we need to file for bankruptcy immediately. <laughs> um, so we don't typically talk about that all the time, but it, if we wanted to, we could, we could spend millions of dollars every year replacing water and sewer lines and storm drains. Was there, a, I think I saw Kathy's hand up earlier. Yeah, I saw the, actually the three hands up. Bernie has, we haven't heard from Bernie to give him first crack. And then Kathy and Dorothy, so I see three hands. Bernie? Thanks. Um, I'm going to say what for Amherst has been a foul, dirty word, uh, betterments. Uh, to my knowledge, Amherst has never charged a betterment when we have to expand a water or a sewer line. Other communities do. That would go at least partway to offsetting the cost of some of the expansions and some of the replacements that we've, uh, well, expansion pr primarily that we, we've we've had to do. And I, I think that that uh, that should be taken in as a considered as a policy. And um, I don't think we have any water lines that are were around when Lord Jeff was here, but. Um, uh, Guilford's point is well taken. The other thing that we need to pay attention to, and it'll come up with the DEP emergency response plan, is uh, storm drains are uh, um, are, are going to become, if they they are they are a more critical piece of infrastructure now than they have been in the past because of uh, more concerns about polluting uh, pollution. Yeah, and I think there's you'll see some questions on that in a minute. Um, I just didn't get any response, but yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know if, on the question of betterments. I'm not sure that uh, you are you thinking of when new construction goes on and that requires. No, I, I, I'm thinking uh, of there's been a lot of work up in Amherst Woods. That whole subdivision, I believe, was built on um, septic and and wells and. You know, there's been a lot of new new plumbing installed there, and um, the uh, that's being the cost of that is being absorbed by the uh, the, the water and sewer funds. And Guilford can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the, that's the kind of example. I think when a new subdivision is built, that the developer needs to pay for that infrastructure. But when we have to go back in and and uh, um, basically redo areas because of failing wells or failing septic. Um, that's um, an improve or an improvement to the property, and uh, there should be some temporary payment for that that, that goes for making those improvements. You know, I uh, certainly recall the town meeting discussion about the uh, Amherst Woods, which was originally built on septic and then converted to sewer, which is what you're. I think referring to, and as that project uh, was placed for everybody to pay for, as opposed to just the homeowners in that neighborhood. Kathy? Um, so I, I appreciate Bernie raising this. I had a slightly different thing, but I, I would love to have it when we're get beyond this budget to talk about, are there some policy changes we'd like to talk about? So I wanna keep that on a list. Um, one of my 
cross thoughts when I saw these uh, questions that Bob did is that in our capital improvement plan uh, program, you don't see the enterprise funds. So you both don't see it here in the operating budget um, with what's looming, you know, where is it going? And I found I was looking for something else. I was looking for something called linkage fees, which are a little bit like your betterment fee, Bernie, but it's when it first comes in, you know, that you're contributing toward the public. But the town of Medford, when they do the capital improvement plan or program, they have a whole section on enterprise funds. So they, they flip to it at one point to say, and to, you know, to try to think of signaling, um, yeah, Guilford is telling us it's millions of dollars, but just what's in the offing, what are we doing now? We don't easily have a place to put that other than when we vote a, a rate increase. You have to go back and find your notes or find the meeting we talked about it. So it might it's something for the future, Sean, to think of, you know, how do we package this? So you where's the best place to put some of this and um, so people can see it? Yeah, and um, I don't know, Guilford, are water connection fees and linkages the same thing? Yes, I would consider a sewer connection fee, uh, a water connection fee, or a link is the same as a linkage. Because if okay. you, you connect to the system, you pay a fee based on what size you're connecting to. Okay. And the people and the people in Amherst Woods, just so you know, it, it, the cost of installing the sewer in Amherst Woods wasn't borne by all the people in the town. The system the town has is as Mr. As Bernie has said, is um, the first person on the sewer and water system will pay the most money by the time everyone's connected. The last person on the water or sewer system will pay the least amount of money. So it's the existing customers who pay for the addition or the expansion into new customer world. And the new customers pay only the connection fees, which are very small compared to the overall fees of the sewer or water line. And just so you, um, the reason I brought that up is because the water connection fees are broken out on, um, in the revenue section of the enterprise funds. Um, you'll see that in the sewer and, the, and on the water side. But I, I think your point about um, including the capital for enterprise is one of, um, is a good point. And um, now that we have the capital improvement program, I, you know, sort of a foundation for it, that might be something we can think about adding to it in the future. It's otherwise kind of missing. So Bob has been in all, you know, he can see where the costs are coming from, but he can't see the big capital project. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, I don't think we should have to bulk up the operating budget, this budget book per se, but just figure out how to sure. capture each year. Yeah. Dorothy? Yeah, I'm okay. So um, there's a, a question, and well, actually two questions for Guilford. Um, I just was, uh, somebody sent me material from 1986 when there was a um, uh, moratorium on building suggested on the grounds of, but it wasn't clear whether there was, the town had sufficient water and sewer. Um, and, um, you know, so it was kind of fun reading some, what was going on 35 years before. Um, I have not heard from Guilford that that's something that we worry about now. Um, and, um, you know, with Centennial, although it's very expensive, it's part of the kind of protection system to make sure that we don't say we don't have enough water and sewer. So I wanted to ask Guilford whether in fact things are different now than they were in 1986 when there was a worry that excessive building and development might um, uh, stress or tax uh, the town system. So those are really, that's really kind of a nice, you have to go back in time to think about what happened at that time. Um, the great water shortage of Amherst happened about that time and UMass had to close down and send students home. And it was actually during a period of time when the town was converting from a certain, actually the Brickyard well field, which is out near Amherst Woods, they were converting from that water source and they were building new water sources, which were wells one, two, three, four um, and five as well. So, it, well, sorry about that. Uh, so we were converting from our sources of water to um, at that time period. And we were a little, the town was a little slow in doing it and a little behind. 
and they got caught up in a drought and they got caught up in a situation where they ran, almost ran out of water. They actually kind of did run out of water. Um, so that time period um, was kind of an interesting time period. We actually have a t-shirt in the office here that says, I survived the water shortage at UMass or something like that. It's in Amy's office. Um, but no, right now we are really doing quite well. If you go back and look at the tie and bond study we had, not tie and bond, the Tata and Howard study we had done, it talked about things we needed to do to make our water portfolio much more resilient. And we've done a, a great deal of those. Um, when we bring Centennial back online, we will be at a very good place with our water supply. Um, we'll be able to meet DEP requirements. We'll be able to have additional water that if we want to have, and support the continued growth in town. The only thing that we have to pay attention to is some type of permitting requirements that will limit withdrawals at certain times of the years, which is common in the new waste, uh, new water management act permits. So those are, that's the only thing we have to worry about for the future is that type of restriction. But right now we have a good source of water. We have a varied source of water. Um, Centennial gets back online and, and we will be sitting very well in the water world and for the future growth and supporting the future growth that people want to see happen here. Thank you. I, I, I thought that was so, but I, I was hoping it was so. And then I had one other question. When you were talking about converting septic tanks to town water, um, the people did pay for that themselves, right? The town did not bear the cost, is that correct? The property owner has to pay for a connection fee and to repipe their sewer on their property into the sewer connection we give them. So yes, they have to repipe it and that's all. But it's a relatively small number compared to what the town put in. The town put in the big pipes that went down, essentially under the streets pretty much. Well, the town paid for the sewer pipes, the paving and the pump stations and all that stuff, yes. And so it's all the connection. Is, when the town uh, when, when because we, we had to pay about 30 some thousand to redo our connection on Amity Street and there were town people a uh, police and DPW people who would sometimes supervise sometimes check and whatever I don't know whether we paid that or whether the town pays the cost of that in terms of town for, contributions the, the town the town pays for that it does. You, okay. you pay for the police detail, but the town pays for um, the DPW employees to check and make sure things are going well. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Sean, back to you. Are you okay. I guess through enterprise funds. Yeah. So now we're into the water um, fund. So the question was about. Um, uh, this one was for, for Guilford to provide a brief summary of the scope and any potential financial impacts um, of a new DEP emergency response plan. And you can see Guilford's response there. And then there's the same thing about a drought emergency response plan. So, uh, Guilford, um, in the discussions that uh, we had and led by Kathy and, and, and Bernie about possibly coming up with a different strategy for metering, we, we talked about possibly having two meters per house where there's an irrigation system. Would that be part of this? Um. I think DEP is leaning very much towards having two meters uh, and DEP is leaning very much towards having a very expensive control system for the metering so that you can actually physically shut meters down from remote locations, hmm. um, which would be a big, that would be a big cost to our system if we actually have to do that. Okay, thank you. So what would go on the second meter, uh, you say, uh, is this farms or residential also? Um, they're pushing more, they're pushing more for residential. Um, really, there's a, a strong group of people who are pushing to stop people from watering their lawns. 
Um, take potable water and putting it on lawns is something people want to have, they want to stop it. It's using a valuable resource um, for basically an aesthetic reason and it's taken away from the environment and it's putting a stress on the environment. So the second meter would be for irrigation and it could be for a house irrigation or it could be for a farm or some type of business irrigation. But they're looking, there's a lot of talk about splitting the two apart and having more control over irrigation. So this next question was about exploring new sources of drinking water. And I think Gilford sort of already yeah. described that about um, sort of once Centennial's online, sort of, this sort of optimizes our number of sources. Uh, the next question was about, um, I think this is mostly about indirect costs and how indirect costs get charged to the enterprise fund. Um, and asking about some of the modifications that might happen in the future. Um, and so, so the, the way the indirect costs work is it's sort of a reimbursement from the enterprise fund to the general fund and it, it's a revenue source on the general fund side. So yeah, if there's any um, changes in the methodology, it's, it's, it would, you know, one side would go up, one side would go down, depending on what that change is. Um, so it should overall be sort of a, a zero change. Um, and we have started uh, with Guilford and Sonia and some others, we have started looking at the types of things that go into the, into the indirect cost number. And we've looked at even more, some of the things that are not in that number and that are directly charged to the enterprise fund. And that is another thing that we might change for FY23 um, between now and next year is doing a hard look at what, what's in each category, whether it be a direct charge or an indirect charge, and, and does it still make sense um, given how some roles have changed. Um, one example I can give you is that we've talked about is like the procurement officer. Um, the procurement officer provides a lot of services to the enterprise funds. Um, I think right now it's a direct charge, right, Guilford? It is. And, and so that's one that we're talking about, you know, should it continue to be a direct charge or should it be in the indirect? Because it, it fluctuates at times how much, um, how much work uh, that person's doing for each fund. Um, so that is something we're doing. And then the last one in water, um, the revenue amount of 4.6 million assumes usage will be at 1 million um, hundred cubic feet. This is the same usage assumed for the current year budget. This appears to be a conservative assumption given the current plans uh, for UMass to fully reopen in the fall. Is that correct? And do you have any estimates of actual usage for the fiscal year? Um, so just like transportation, if you look at the numbers for FY21, um, we're expecting the actual numbers for FY21 to come in lower than budget. And so, you know, this is a ballpark figure, but I, you know, based on what I just looked at through April, um, we're probably going to come in somewhere between 80 and 90% of what we budgeted for FY21 in terms of consumption. So, so yeah, we are, we are doing a conservative figure for FY22, um, but it's not, but it, it is assuming a little bit of a bounce back in terms of consumption. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the water fund that weren't talked about? Questions generally about water fund. Because I know I really, we, we've really spent a lot of time on water and sewer with, with through the rate discussion. So I think a lot of the questions may have been about fund may have come up through that discussion already. All right, do you want me to move on to sewer? I think so. Okay. Um, Guilford, you probably want to speak to this. This is going to be a, an issue that's going to affect many areas of town government, and that's the, um, uh, the cost of things increasing generally um, and, and the lead time to get those things. You want to expand on that a little bit, Guilford? Um, so right now, the biggest, the biggest impact we're seeing is in lumber prices. And people have read, seen it in the paper that lumber is tripled. Um, so we, we are having, I mean, the price is going up and the supply is not there. Um, sometimes we're actually having to probably pay premium prices because we need lumber. And the only thing that's available is premium lumber, even though we're going to just use it for a non-premium use. Um, we're seeing problems in 
or being there's been reports about shortage of chemicals such as chlorine. Um, we don't think that's a problem for the water and wastewater side because it seems to be the solid pool tablets that are the problem, not the gaseous chlorine or the sodium hypochlorate that we use in our systems. Um, so we're just overall we're seeing that because people had to shut down and workers didn't work, um, supply is limited and low and um, they're having a hard time building back up supply because everyone's using it as normal, but the supply was definitely reduced quite a bit. <clears throat> We've also, the thing that gets us is electric, electronics. A lot of the electronic things we buy, um, they're like your cell phone. They want you to buy them and use them for a year and then buy a new one. Um, they're quite expensive. And when you add up, you need a lot of them, like you need 30 or 40 of them. Um, the price is very exorbitant, exorbitant over the year of replacing them. And this mentality is, is hurting our system because, I mean, we'll buy a piece of equipment and it'll break in five years, but we have to buy a whole new piece of equipment, not just a replacement part. Um, so that's the second part of the supply and maintenance part we're having problems with right now as well. Yeah, and I think we expect this will you know, we're going to see this in other, like the regular capital plan for FY22 as well. There may be um, projects um, that we're not getting as much for as we thought, like the 200000 for facility improvements that might not go as far as we thought it might. Um, the, the amounts that were budgeted for vehicles, we've seen some increases in vehicle prices as well. Um, there were shortages in semiconductors and things like that, the, the chips that they put in these new vehicles. Um, so it's just, it's an area we've got to monitor, I think, for all of our capital projects. And um It'll certainly be a challenge for FY22 um, if uh, things don't start going back the other way. Questions from the committee? I'll come back to one later when we get to DPW. Uh, Okay, we have a couple more questions. I won't read these. Yeah, go ahead. I'll let, I'll let you all just look at this. But the first question was about um, dye testing and, and Guilford provided a response to um, the dye testing and to verify service line locations. And then there was also a question about um, related to septic dumping rates um, and increased treatment costs. And you can see Guilford's response to that. Are you suggesting in that last one that the council get involved in the rate discussion? I, I wasn't suggesting it. I was just asking whether this was something that, you know, the council or the select board in the past had, you know, dealt with. I should have um, clarified that a little bit. Wilford, do you know if that rate is... Um was on that fee list that I sent out. Was that one of the fees listed on the under DPW or under water and sewer? It is one of the fees. Okay. So we did, it is on our sort of master list that we've, we've been monitoring and we're going to kind of take a look at every year. So it's, it's definitely something we'll be looking at. And septic septic is a very small amount that comes into the wastewater system. So any questions further on sewer? and recognizing that we recently spent a lot of time on water and sewer fund. I have seen no hands go up, so uh, I think we can go on to my favorite fund. Solid waste. <laughs> um, the one thing, can I just say one final thing about water and sewer? Um, you know, it's unclear yet whether the American Rescue Plan funds can be used to make up for shortfalls in water and sewer. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, the, you know, one of the eligible uses of those grant funds is revenue replacement, um, but they're, they're sort of still defining what is included in that revenue replacement number. I've seen some different definitions of what they think will go into that. Um, and the last thing I saw, you know, there was a question about whether utilities would be allowed to be counted in that. Um, and so, 
I'll, I'll give you an update as soon as I get more information, but this is, I think the transportation fund, the water fund and the sewer fund would, would be good candidates um, potentially for those funds because they all have, they're, they're all expected to have revenue deficits this year and it's all directly related to the pandemic. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then we only had one question for solid waste. Um, <laughs> And it was more of a comment. So I just put thank you in there. Uh, it wasn't really a question. It was yeah, I, um, commending the staff, which was a, appreciated. Yeah, I, as I say, I'm a regular user of the transfer station. And um, it was pretty remarkable the efforts they went to to kind of lay things out so people could, um, you know, recycle things um, um, safely. So. Okay. And the, and the one sort of thing to note about the solid waste fund there, um, I believe, so they're an FY21, again, if you look at solid waste, you'll see a, a dip down. And that's because for FY21, we, as I mentioned last night, we increased it for that roll off truck that the town had to have a matching share of. And now that that's gone, um, that decreased the, the budget a little bit. Blue. Uh, we've had a constituent inquiry as to whether or not now that we're uh, rolling off all the, the restrictions with COVID, whether or not the transfer station will go back to full operation, including uh, take it or leave it. <laughs> That's a Guilford question, right? I don't think. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. It is. <laughs> We would prefer, we're, we're looking at how to bring it back and how to make it a little better than it is now. Um, the take it or leave it is actually one of the money lo losers for the transfer station. So um, it, we've actually probably made, I mean, this, this fund has made money over the pandemic. And I think that was probably because we weren't taking as much take it or leave it stuff. And uh, we cut out a lot of the things that are very low low return for what we do. So um, we need to take a, a, a better look at it and then see whether we're gonna bring it back or not. Maybe you can take it or leave it with a pot for donations. <laughs> the only question on take it or leave it is that it might may it be a money maker that we don't know about secretly is whether anybody is actually buying stickers in order to get in if, to the facility to use that uh, attribute. Dorothy? Uh, following up on that program, uh, Bob, who is a regular at the transfer station, uh, was upset at the fact that the bikes are not being found, new homes are not being found for them. And, you know, he was just thinking of past collection of bikes for Rotary and whatever, or Lions Club, I guess it was. So, you know, I, I, I could, Certainly don't want a policy that would it, that makes this uh, transfer station not break even, but some stuff really should be uh, moved on to people who need it. So that that would be one of those things we're talking about, looking at how to re restructure it so that we can actually move things to where they need to go and not just get the town get stuck holding it and then having to throw it away and pay for it. That that would be something that would be very we'd be very interested in talking with that person about. Um, we'll do. Question that I have about the fund: uh, How is the um, amount that we're having to pay now to get rid of our recycle, or because we're not? And how much are we are we actually still getting paid for any of the recycle? And how's that affecting the fund? So um, we we stopped using. Well, we stopped being a permanent member of the MRF um, many years ago. And what we've done is used whoever is the cheapest to get rid of our material, um, which actually it's still the MRF for bottles and cans, although um, we've been using another vendor for bottles and cans right now. We take all our paper to um, Sunoco directly to the recycler and they, they, they pay us for it. Um, prices have been good. They've stayed on the positive side. Um, they have not stayed positive, positive enough to have us make money or to offset our cost, but 
they've been, um, we haven't had to really, we haven't had a large increase in the price of getting rid of paper. So we, we watch it ourselves and we kind of try to manage it the best we can and keep the, play the market and keep the market working in our favor. So at this point, that has not affected the viability of the fund? No, we, we've been able to maintain what we've been doing in the past and not uh, negatively impact the fund or cost, you know, cost more money or anything. And I gather the premium for cardboard must have gone away because you don't ask people to separate cardboard. Um, we, we do have a bin for cardboard only, but we, you don't, yeah, you don't have to separate it, no. But you do get more money for cardboard, um, more money for white paper, and less money for mixed. Kathy? Um, as the, um, Andy mentioned that maybe people buy a uh, transfer station sticker so they can bring their stuff to leave it. Um, and that would actually be a good description of us that we once a year used to buy the transfer station sticker to bring some stuff to take her to leave it. But my question was about um, garbage and recyclables. Now that we're down to, I think just one company and their rates have gone up a lot. Have you seen an uptick where people are actually using it? I mean, is there a way of you judging that? Because I realize we, we're generating so little right now and the cost is so much higher than it was two years ago to have the truck come and pick up a half empty garbage can. But I don't know whether that leads people to say, I'm just gonna throw it in my car and bring it over to transfer station. Do you have any sense of that? Uh, yes, we had about a 10 or 15% increase in sticker sales, um, probably around December when the, the new rates went out with, for USA. And is there, this is a bigger discussion, so it's not for today, but um, when there was some competition, um, one thought that maybe you had choices, whether the choices turned out all to have the same rate. So it wasn't exactly clear to me whether we had a choice or not. Um, is our town starting to take this back that they are doing their waste, you know, a waste fund where they're actually the town is providing the service. Has that happened regionally or in the state at all? There are communities that have our type of system where you just tell the tell the residents to get your own service. Um, there are communities that are looking at now trying to consolidate their waste system in some method whether it be contracting out a hauler for the entire town or sections of the town or trying just to consolidate it. And they're doing it for two reasons. One is, is better, they think they can get a better price. And the second reason is, is that it reduces the amount of vehicles driving around town. So it's more of a climate greenhouse reduction tool. You know, it was it was not necessarily a bad thing to go to one because the trucks used to go up and down the small streets at different times a day, but it's more what has happened to the pricing since that happened in Amherst. Yeah. So. Okay, so that's just that's a longer range question. Um, so no one's just taken it back like bought their own truck, um, but they've used the leverage of a town saying we're going to buy for the whole town. Well, uh, I won't say no one has not done that. I haven't heard of anyone. Okay, okay. Thanks. We've never thought about becoming our own municipal trash collectors. Hmm. Uh, you know, my experience has been, I grew up in New Jersey and lived in the Northern Virginia for a while. And in both places, the, the town or the, the in, in uh, Northern Virginia, it was a county uh, did the, the trash collection and the recyclables. I mean, it was just part of, you, you, you know, part of your taxes, you know. So it's, on the other hand, we've had, we've, we've, we have property on Cape Cod and we've always had to pay for, <laughs> for trash removal <laughs> there, so. Yeah, I mean, the problem with that is, Bob, that um, if, you, if we were to switch now and you were to build, wanted to build it into the tax rate and uh, uh, would you end up with a uh, tax uh, proposition to tax cap problem? 
and you'd almost have to set it up through an enterprise fund anyway in order to avoid that issue. Yeah. <clears throat> the, I wasn't suggesting we do that. I'm just sort of commenting yeah. that it seems to be a Massachusetts <laughs> thing or maybe a New England thing. It, it, it's a, the, the town dump uh, is a New England thing. And I, since I moved to Amherst, moved back to Amherst, I felt disconnected because I didn't make, I haven't been making my weekly trip to the transfer <laughs> state or the dump to have coffee and donuts and throw out the trash and catch up on the news. Um, I think the town could, I think trash collection is exempt from 30B. So in, in we could probably, if the town wanted to find a single trash vendor, I think we could probably do that, but I don't, don't take that, um, uh, I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little rusty, so I don't take that for uh, for a fact. Okay. This issue is going to come up when we get the ACAC report. So look forward to it. Rich report. Ecac. The environmental <laughs> community. Oh, okay. Action report. I didn't realize that uh, they had a connection in here. It was an um, environmental issue at the point when we had two different companies running duplicate truck routes. And I remember that discussion going on fairly lengthy. But as it turns out, as Kathy has pointed out, the there was a cost to getting to one truck route called the lack of competition. Unless we regulate it ourselves, we've got a problem because we can't control it. Anything else having to do with uh, the enterprise funds? Because if not, uh, Dorothy. So one of the reasons a town would go to its own collection system is if it's having trouble with illegal dumping. So I would like to ask Guilford if there has been an increase in illegal dumping since we've reduced to one um, truck going around and he's raised the prices. My, my answer is there's not an increase. The amount of legal, illegal dumping we have has, ma has maintained itself and it's still pretty high. Um, we actually had a town resident tell an employee yesterday and he was telling me, um, the, the resident said, well, I just tell my residents to put their trash on the front lawn they don't want to take with them. And it sits there for three weeks. And then I call the town and tell them someone dumped trash on my yard. Mm. The town comes and picks it up. Uh, so it, it hasn't, we do have a dumping problem in this town. And um, it would be, that would be one of the ways to actually at least try to cover the cost of the dumping is to have a townwide trash collection system. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. I would go for it. Aren't those usually the bigger items like furniture and things like that that people are? They are. It's usually, it's furniture. It's sometimes, sometimes we've had people just leave big piles of clothes out in front of people's houses. It's, um, it's amazing what people will leave behind because they don't want to move it because they're going so far away. We have a little gully off of Pine Road and there's a resident who lives over there who regularly goes down and picks up trash, Andy, where someone just throws, instead of taking it to the dump, that's where they and she tracked them down when they put unopened envelopes in it so she could report. <laughs> it was just, and they could say, I think I know where this is coming from, but she called <laughs> conservation to come get it, to clean it out. So it's, it's a site that you can't quite see unless you know to look for it. So it's not just furniture is all I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. In, in Northern Virginia, uh, twice a year, there would be a pickup of heavy goods like you know old washing machines and beds and things like that so then they'd have a special truck come out um so if we were to do something like that that might be something to consider is you know like in at the end of may or something after the college students leave <laughs> have a have a, a truck go around and pick up big things sounds like we do anyway yeah, right. 
Anything else on the, on the budgets? Because we always need to stick with the budgets. Um, so do we want to go back to the uh, DPW budget? Yeah. So um, so the DPW budget is also broken into to different sections. Um, so the first section is administration. Right. And the first question was about um, the EPA's stormwater program and the financial impact. Um, Gilbert, do you want to walk through your response to this first one? Uh, yes. So yes, there can be there can be significant impact. Um, like I, I've said a couple times, the first few years of the program are for us to figure out what we need to address, what problems we have in town, and we expect to do that for the next few years. And then once we address or figure out our problems and we can decide which ones we want to address and hopefully we get to we get to decide what we want to address and we're not told what to address by the EPA or DEP. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a in a figuring out phase now. Um, if the cost of doing these projects or the projects are not that big, we can continue, can continue to use chapter 90 and general fund money to solve them while we do bigger projects, or we may have to go to a stormwater utility and come up with some way to fund these projects if, they're, if the, there's a timeline for repairing them or fixing them and there's some type of um, urgency put with it that's beyond just working it into the regular projects. Gilford, what's the, I think the bylaws were just approved, right? The, the two bylaws. Um, so what's the next step um, what's the next big step now that the bylaws are in place? Well, the bylaws are only a, a one, a, one of several steps. So the bylaws now let us manage new, new development and redevelopment. And they also allow us to take care of illicit connections to the stormwater system. So those two are totally two other pieces of the, of the, the permit we have to deal with. And the bigger piece, like I say, is figuring out what's wrong. So the thing that will be going on is just identifying our storm drains, identifying the outfalls of our storm drains, and then coming up with a testing program to see what type of contaminants we're finding in those storm drains and in those outfalls, and then adjusting our program to eliminate those contaminants. Questions from the committee for regarding administration? Or do you wanna go through the rest of the questions? Maybe that makes uh, there's a, there were a couple other questions. Um, one was about the Water Management Act permit. Um, and you can see Guilford's response to that. And there's another question um, related to that in terms of staffing and procedures. You're gonna, uh, by the way, these questions and the answers that uh, you're gonna yeah, yeah, these are all set to go, so I can send them right after this meeting um, to, to the committee and to Athena. Okay. Anything else there? So are there any questions regarding, or additional questions regarding General Public Works Administration. Highway gets into the exciting questions of uh, <laughs> our roads and sidewalks. Yeah, so the first question was about private roads and, and the ones that the town is still maintaining. Um, and Guilford gave a response about how that's minimal. Do you wanna add anything to that, Guilford? Um, we're just we're just trying to get them. We've been talking to a lot of them. We're trying to get them either to upgrade their road and be accepted, um, or to be let them know that they're responsible for them. We have we have like three, I think, that will be coming to the town council at some point. Um, Hall Drive is one of them. They repaved the road. They want to become a public way. They don't want to be a private way anymore. Um, and then you have the Amherst Hills neighborhood that's working to becoming a public way. Um, and I think there's one other street in there that I can't remember the name off the top of my head that they're working to get their, their roads as public ways as well. And um, that's, that's kind of the direction we're taking right now. 
And you are not plowing any of the private roads, is my understanding. Um, there's one or two that still get plowed for one reason or another beyond the fact that it's just a, a private way that we've always plowed it. Lar Larkspur Drive is the primary one that that's supposed to be turned over as a public way and it was built to be a public way, but it hasn't been turned over yet. So it gets plowed. Amherst Hills, they're supposed to be turned over as public ways. They get plowed. Those are the ones that definitely get plowed. We took over, we did plowing for Hall Drive because they started the process of becoming a public way. Um, so there are some that are going through the process of becoming a public way that we're now plowing and that's it, just plowing. Just marks for a bit anyway. Questions on this or should we keep moving? Anything else about the, because uh, most of it really is in the um, capital plan for the discussion of the, the roads yeah. and sidewalks. Yeah. So I, I, I wrote this question before the weather got a little warmer, but <laughs> since we had a snowfall about three weeks ago, I thought. <laughs> so this this is where we stand right now as far as the snow and ice budget we we okay. do have a, a small surplus this year eleven thousand dollars we were able to cut it pretty close there well managed good job yeah they did, they did a good job this year Moving on to street lights and traffic lights. Yeah, the the, 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 the reason for this question was really just, um, you know, at some of these intersections, there's a, a bunch of cars idling for a minute or so, and that does add up and, you know, it, I have no idea. I had no idea what the cost would be to upgrade these signals, um, and I don't know how many we would need to upgrade. Um, but um, it might be something to consider for some of the more the, some of the busier intersections. Well, the, bi the biggest intersection uh, is North Amherst. Yeah. And Finally, we got a at least a short-term resolution to that. Are the cameras installed on that now? Is it automatic? Yes, the cameras and the automatic controller are installed. And, and the response here, we're missing $100,000. It can range anywhere from 15 grand to $100,000 mm -hmm. currently to upgrade the intersections. The word more shouldn't be there. It should be a hundred thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's a lot of money. <laughs> Kathy. Yeah, I had a question. I mean, we do have. Thank you, Guilford. The North Amherst light, which. The other day I was astonished because there was we were backed up almost to 116 and we all got through, which used to be an experience of six changes of the traffic light. Um, so does that light automatically um, change how long it stays green left hand turn at different times of day? And can you see what can you, I know it's smarter than dumb lights were, but you know, so can you say, okay, at five o'clock, we need to leave that green signal on longer in the morning, we need it on the other direction. It, does it 
readjust itself or is that someone back in your headquarters making those judgments? No, it readjusts itself and it doesn't, it doesn't go by a set program that says this is Friday, do it this way. Um, it actually just monitors the traffic and it has a minimum time and it has a maximum time it can operate. So it'll start with the minimum time and if it does sees that it didn't clear the queue, it will add more time to the next queue. And then it just keeps adding up until it gets to the maximum. And then it watches traffic and as traffic's not, if, if the light's green for too long in one queue, it'll start reducing it back down to the minimum. So it does that automatically. Because that seems, that's what our observation has been, that it's it's work, you know, like, oh, well, that was really long. Next time it wasn't, that it, it looked like it was uh, being smart, which is why it's called a smart light. So the right. other, um, you said you hadn't, I think you said you hadn't added it let, has you, have we started to be able to count traffic in multiple directions and then count, you had to add something special for pedestrian. And I wouldn't, you know, but just to get a sense of how many people are walking through that intersection or riding a bike through? Uh, no, we're trying to resolve, there, there's two pieces that we, there's two pieces there. One is the pedestrian and bicycle and we haven't worked that one out yet. And then the vehicle counting, we also haven't worked out yet. There's something we need to add on to the controller for the vehicles. And we're still trying to just find the right product to count the pedestrians and the, um, the bicyclists. And we haven't added those, those on yet. You know, so it's, it's less that, that I need to know that because I'm living up here. But if we think in terms of trying to reroute the roads and go back for a mass works grant, we had to do expensive traffic studies before. And this could potentially give us counts that would be if we're back and reopened and North Square is in full function, you know, with people there, we would get a better sense of, of the flow in all directions. Um, so that was just um, trying to think forward that this would be a useful source of information for future planning. Then I, my second is, I think it's on street, streets and tap. Um, what's the, what is the cost if you are at a crosswalk to put in a solar powered light that shows up at night. So it illuminates it. We've got one over at Coles that I think North Square installed, but we've got some crosswalks that I've noticed that not only the lines eroding away, but you can't see them at night because there's not a street light. Is there a way of putting something that illuminates both the fact that there is a crosswalk, um, so cars see that people are coming, but that people also know there's a crosswalk there, the pedestrians. Is there a cheap-ish cheap, cheap -ish way of doing that's not electrical? Um, uh, I guess it depends on what you call cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we can put a traffic, we can put a street light in. Um, some places we can put street lights in, some places we can't put street lights in. Uh, just because of how the power is set up, but um, there's a, there's the possibility of doing a street light, but that just lights up the ground. And if the the if the paint's not there, you just see the asphalt. You don't see the crosswalk. There are signs. We put signs up at most crosswalks. They're reflective. That's the cheapest cheapest way. The rectangular flashing beacons we can put in if we need to. Those are anywhere from nine to twelve thousand dollars a pair. Um, and those actually, those are actually pretty substantial. So they don't get destroyed by young college students who want to try to rearrange the world sometimes. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It's so going on. Do you want to talk about the automation programmer? Um, yes, actually, on both these, um, the electricians work in the street lights and traffic light division. They both kind of work that. So that's why we put their accomplishments there, just so you know. 
there's not really a good place to put them out of the places because they're kind of small in the rest of the world. The programmer is um, almost everything we own in our water plants, our pump stations, our wastewater plant, um, and even our traffic control systems are all have a program to them and run on a program. It's not like it's not like the IT programmers who just program your computers and set things up in your in that, but it's what we call a process con programmers. Um, and we definitely, at some point, we're going to have to set up either a lot of money to pay someone outside to do it, or we're going to have to hire a position and fund a position that's a programmer who just does this. Um, we have enough work for them. Um, it's just uh, we need to decide which way to go. Um, right now, we use a um, we use an individual who will be retiring soon, um, and he's he likes what he does and he doesn't charge us very much. But we get a lot of work from him. But at some point, we're going to need this to invest in a programmer for um, all the stuff we have that needs programming. Um, it's just something we all need to do. Guilford, is the um, electrician position still vacant or was that, did that get filled? No, but we have both our electricians are on staff now. Okay, good. Jackie, is your hand up for this or is that? Yeah, from... yeah it was from before. Sorry, it was from before. I forget Dorothy? to take it. Okay, then I'm just. Just Dorothy, a comment on that programmer. Um, <clears throat> it now clarifies what a friend of mine did many years ago when he left New York City for somewhere near Boston. And all he could say was, I got to program the traffic lights. Well, he was a very brilliant, trained person. He's not, people who do that kind of work are not cheap. So I don't know what, Guilford, what do you think it's gonna cost to get somebody um, in the competitive market? Well, that's, that's been our problem. We haven't been able to attract anybody. Um, we attract our electricians who actually, they can make a lot more money on the outside they're making for us, but they want a different style of, a different lifestyle. Um, and we've had high turnover in our electrical positions. Um, they're here for a short period, their lifestyle, their life changes and they're ready to go back to making a lot of money. They don't need to stay home with their children or their families, so they leave us. And we're probably gonna end up in some type of situation like that where we're, we're probably gonna be paying a high end, almost close to 100 grand for someone doing this. And we're only gonna have them for a short period of time and then we're gonna to have to replace, replace them and get somebody else, um, which is fine. I completely understand that, but um, that's probably where we are with this type of position. Are there other positions within uh, areas that you supervise where we also are having problems finding qualified people? We're any, any, actually all our jobs right now, we're finding, having a hard time finding qualified people. Um, wastewater and water jobs, definitely we're having a hard time. We're actually just bringing people in who are interested in getting into the field and we're training them ourselves. And we're finding we train them, we pay them what we can pay them, and then they can find, they can find better paying jobs and better work hours at Springfield Water and Sewer Commissioners and at other larger facilities. And even some of the smaller facilities, they can find more work or more pay and better working conditions um, than we have. And they leave and we start all over again. So um, the job, finding someone to work right now is very, very difficult. I mean, we can't even find truck drivers right now to work for us, um, which is nationwide. They're having a truck driver shortage, but we can't find qualified truck drivers or people who are qualified to work in construction type work because they can be get, they can get more money elsewhere. They get more money um, doing something else um, and they're cap fully capable of it. So is this what you would put as a long-term budget challenge? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very long-term time. It's a, yeah, a long-term budget challenge and a long-term just operational challenge. Other questions from the committee? So, um, who 
Brooklyn maintenance. Um... Yeah, so this wasn't a, uh, wasn't a question. This is more of a comment. Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, having a digitized maintenance schedule would be a good step forward in making sure things don't fall between the slip between the cracks. Um, I've, I've, I've threatened uh, my, my wife and myself that I would create a digital list of all the canned goods we have <laughs> so we don't buy 10 cans of beans that we don't need. <laughs> And then in, under tree and ground maintenance, there's a question about the um, cemetery land. And I think that's sort of an open yeah, question. Yeah, I just, I pose this because I think this is an issue that, you know, maybe the council needs to address, you know, does the town really want to stay in the cemetery business? We are getting to the point where we are running out of vacancies in our hotel. Um, and we need to decide whether to expand or to just be a maintenance type facility. Um, the other, the other cemetery in town is also, I understand they have, a, a, they have openings and availabilities, but they seem to be having some other issues. So it may be something the council might choose to think about having a discussion with them. Does does maintaining them also mean you mow them? Are you in charge of to the extent there's grass and you go between them? We mow them, we trim them, yes. The only thing, most of the headstone repairs are, are done by um, planning through a um, C, CP, CPAC grants. Most of the headstones we do that way, but we do all the grass cutting, the, the fence painting and all that stuff is done by DPW. And is that, uh, I actually had a resident write me that she was uh, distraught on the state of the historic cemetery, the one downtown with Emily Dickinson, of gr grass and weeds. And I didn't know how much of that was coming out of winter. And I know the headstones are being repaired. So is, I, I didn't send it through yet to Paul. <laughs> But so it, the, the section of the cemetery she's talking about, the historic commission wanted to keep it in what it considered to be a historic, um, historic naturalized, naturalized, yes, a historically naturalized setting because that's they didn't have mowers at that time period, so that's why it's taller and the, we only mow the grass there twice, um, but they do. Uh, there's been a lot of complaints about that. And there's been some discussion about just maintaining it like a normal cemetery. And I think the historic commission is ready to say, no, we just want to maintain it like current standards, not like a historic naturalized area. Thank you. I will, I will let this person know. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jane. Yeah, I um, actually just wanted to weigh in on that cemetery as someone who was on the historical commission up until about like two months ago. Um, so part of the problem with maintaining it, my understanding is that when they were, when people were trying to mull, it was, it was knocking over some of the headstones. So the historical commission has been looking into trying to find ways to help maintain that section of the cemetery without damaging the headstones and so they've been looking into uh sheep or goats and I think they found that goats were too uh destructive and so they were the last I had heard they were working with someone to see if they could find sheep to help herd some of that grass sorry I don't know if that makes any sense <laughs> or if that's helpful at all yeah Kathy, are you, did you have anything further? Yeah, um, I was actually going to shift off the graveyard to uh, tennis courts and basketball courts. Um, the basketball courts up at Mill River, um, is there, if, if people want to know when will things be finished, since I see you've got them on, you're maintaining them. As you know, right now they're torn up, or last time I looked, a week ago. So it's just... 
Are there ways of knowing timetables? And I'm not sure what you do with tennis courts, whether you are maintaining, we only have, I think the two, unless you're doing the ones for the middle school. So it's, it's a question on DPW's role with each of those areas. So there, there's no changes proposed for the tennis courts right now. We, we did some net repairs and those are, that's just regular maintenance. If the net needs fixing, you just need to let the DPW know the net needs some attention and they'll go do it. Um, the basketball courts, um, the contractor is supposed to be coming in probably the June, middle, first of June, middle of June to do that work at the basketball courts. And we hope to have that all buttoned up at least by the end of July, have it all back together so you can use them. There's actually gonna be an extra court. There's gonna be two full courts and then two half courts that are for smaller, smaller adults, smaller children, sorry, not adults, for smaller children. So there'll be a total of two full courts, two half courts when we're done. I think as you know, they're used all summer long, particularly as kids get out of school. It's, and if someone's over in the swimming pool, the kids are out playing. I mean, it's a, it's a good, good outdoor resource. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paul had something. Uh... So whoever's uh, managing, if it's Athena or whoever could bring Paul in so that he could. Paul has his hand up. Yes. Paul is in our attendee. Athena, are you there? I think Lynn was, Lynn, Lynn are you? Are you uh, co-hosting? And Athena. Um, let me see what I can do, but I don't think I can do anything. Yeah. Athena just brought him in. We don't see him. <laughs> yeah, he's still on the uh, attendee list. I'm sorry, I stepped away for a moment. I'm bringing Paul in now. Hi, Paul. Hi, sorry, it's it's not a big point. <laughs> this was on the cemetery thing. So when I worked at the Cambridge Historical Commission, we have the old burying ground in the middle of Harvard Square, same issues, um, historic um, gravestones. Uh, fight between the historical commission and the DPW because they just want to go and mow it, make it look like a suburban cemetery, and they always damage the stones, whether it was a weed whacker or a, and and there's like permanent damage to these stones from the 18th, 1700s and 1800s. So, um, and people always complained about them, saying it looked unkempt, but that was what those graves, graveyards looked like back. Those burying grounds at the that's what they were called looked like at then at that point in time. Did they use sheep? They they talked about using goats and sheep, but they never did. Have you ever given any thought as to whether we should maintain ourselves in the cemetery business or whether when we've sold out the plots, it's time to move on to other center? Yeah, I think we're, we, we, do we have, are we required to do that, Guilford? We're required to maintain what we have. Um, I don't think we're required to offer, if we don't have space, we're not required to offer space unless we want to. Because we would have to acquire property to do that. Or as you say, acquire another cemetery that's got a lot of maintenance requirements to it. Um, is there anything else? Because I think that we've really, uh, the only thing that I was going to ask you, uh, Guilford, is uh, you had mentioned uh, chlorine costs way back when, um, when we were talking about the enterprise fund for sewer, and that uh, costs had gone up considerably, which I have heard about for um, swimming pool chlorine. Is that end up being on your budget, or does that get charged back to recreation? You're muted. Yeah, there you because you're muted. Sorry, some of the guys were all leaving, so I muted myself. 
Um, the town pools don't use tablet chlorine. We use liquid chlorine. So our prices are actually staying lower than what they norm, what everybody else, if you have a, if you have a home pool and you use the tablet system for chlorination, you're gonna see a much higher price than we are right now. Ours are still staying low. Gas chlor gaseous chlorine and the, um, liquid chlorine are staying about where they were last year. So I see that there's a couple of hands up, uh, Dorothy and Kathy. So Dorothy? Um, it's about whether the town should be in the cemetery business. Um, I would say only if the town could sell a plot at a much cheaper rate than the private ones. But if not, I see no reason to. I mean, we have other cemeteries. Um, Wildwood's not that expensive. Some towns have cemeteries so that they can have more affordable spots. but if you don't have many and they're not affordable, then you just should be maintaining it and making life easier. That's my suggestion. Hey, Kathy. You're muted. Yeah, okay. I'm unmuting, but um, I wasn't going to ask about graveyards or cemeteries. I wanted to go back to um, a, a more general question about the planning and thinking about DPW being in an alternative site. Um, and it, it, can I ask that now or, or should I worry about interrupting the flow? Well, go ahead because- uh, okay. So my, 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 my question, my, my kind of general question, Guilford, seeing the amount of uh, salt and other kinds of materials you're using to maintain roads, is have we looked at the extent if you weren't at this site and someone said, um, it, are there any hazardous material? What's the condition of the soil? Um, are there any things that would have to be cleaned up? Do we know the answer to that? Is that one of the things that would be assessed as we're doing uh, 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 plans for the fire station? So it was a, uh, have we, assess that and if we haven't assessed it would it be should we do it sooner rather than later to avoid a delay if we were going to try to do a fire station there and have you be somewhere else so it's it's a one of the towns in the news was something got on a big delay because of what they found in the soil um on a, a plan for using it for an alternative purpose that's my question so we, we know we have some questionable materials on the site. We know that already. When we've been talking about using it for a fire station, we've brought those up and talked to people. We've had one, we've already been through one, um, one environmental study with DEP because of, we were working in the yard and we had some strong odors coming from the ground. Uh, we brought a, a, a LSPN. Um, we did a whole report, we reported everything to DEP. They found that it was not uh, significant. It wasn't any type of pollution. It was just a release of what was in the soil. Um, but this facility before it was a DPW was the trolley facility. Um, and there were things done here that weren't probably done by DPWs, but um, there is probably some contamination here and they will find some things that probably need to be cleaned up. The biggest thing I see that to reuse this facility is actually, we have asbestos and lead paint in the building. Asbestos, um, we have some asbestos insulation and some asbestos caulking that was used in the glazing of the windows because they're older style windows. And then we do have lead paint in some sections of the building. So, the building is actually has things in it as well as just there might be some things in the ground, but most people know the ground probably definitely because if you dig in the ground, you'll find a layer about six inches deep, about maybe a foot to a foot and a half deep. It's just black and it's um, from creosote just being poured on the ground or oil being poured on the ground. We just have this layer, but there's no indications downstream or upstream or downstream of us that we're actually leaching anything into the water with that study that's been looked at already. 
and we've had this small one small study done about the site itself. But we do know we have lead and we have asbestos in the building. And I realize, you know, Andy, I know we're, we're again, we're on operating budget versus capital, but I am also focused on the way they interact and worried about, I've been worried for a while about, is plan that has been proposed feasible and are we underestimating some of the costs, you know, when we're looking at, so that's Sean, that's one of the reasons I was asking on this. So I, I know it's not answerable right now, but yeah, it, no, it's, it's definitely something we think about. Um, and again, it's one of the reasons why we, we use a lot of conservative assumptions when we do those plans and why we, why we included funds in this year's budget for design work, because we want to start being able to answer those questions. Um, and we can't really do that till we have a good design um, that looks at some of those things. So I think that's, that is a good question, especially in light of the cost stuff that we're talking about too, just with costs generally rising. Um, we wanna see what the town can get for the budget, you know, that's in that plan. Um, and then we can see if we have to make any adjustments from there. But um, no, I think that that's a good question for, for the projects. You know, cause it's a little bit different than design. It, as you can hear, I mean, it's demolition, cleanup costs that have, irrespective of what we're physically going to put there. And is there potentially a long delay because that's not as easy as one might think. Or, or it's more costly than we might think, one or the other. So it's just, a, um, I'm a worrier when it comes to millions of dollars, <laughs> plus or minus. So, yeah. Yeah, I will say on the, on the it's a very small point, um, but on the bright side, we, Paul and I were in a, a meeting recently about some energy incentives um, that might go along with the net zero program. And so if we do, uh, you know, if we will design these buildings to be net zero, there will be some money coming back, um, potentially in uh, incentives from Mass Save and from Eversource um, for those buildings. And we, we were talking in regards to the school, but they said it would also apply to a fire station or a DPW, great. Um, which is good. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we have one attendee, and I don't know if uh, the and the, has any um, public comment or question to ask uh, because uh, so this should be a good time to pose that question. So if the attendee does want to do so, um, be recognized uh, and raised hand, we'd let me know. Because otherwise uh, it is a part of our posted agenda and it's important that we um, include it in every meeting at some point. And I, Want to make sure we get offering that opportunity if uh, attendee wishes. Okay, so um, seeing nothing else uh, that's come up, um, are there um, any other questions for um, Guilford regarding the, or in general regarding the DPW budget, all of its sections? Bob, you're, you're all set with what you need to give us a write-up for the case. Okay. Yeah, um, I think I'm good. Okay, so Guilford and Amy, thank you very much for being here. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, I, unless I see you raised hand from some category, I uh, uh, appreciate you being here. So I think there are only a couple of things that I want to touch on quickly and then I'll let us adjourn earlier today. Um, and uh, of the, the two things, one is that uh, I think that um, everybody um, except for our resident members was at the end of that very long council meeting last night and knows that there was an additional issue that was referred to our committee uh, but uh, one that the resident members may not have been aware of. Um, I don't have the exact wording of the motion, so if I misstated, I have other counselors who are going to correct it. I'm not going to even attempt to do it with an exact wording, but we had a very long discussion about um, the, the whole subject of reparations and reparations um, group came in and um, that led the council to uh, 
want to have a discussion on several um, subjects, one of which was referred to this committee, and that is uh, to help to think through um, what could be a long-term source of funds for a reparations program. Uh, I, it's obviously one that we're not going to really address until after we're done with the budget and get a budget report, get budget recommendations, the budget report off. Um, but it will then have to be on the um, agenda during the first part of June to um, take up the issue. But I didn't want to leave the three members of the committee not knowing that this referral had been made. Um, so if there are any of uh, councilor members who have uh, want to give a better explanation than I just gave, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, or if there are any questions from members who are not present during that portion, um, certainly can ask. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, the, I think you got it right. I think the only thing you didn't get was there is an expectation that we look at this in relationship to this budget that we're recommending uh, and a specific recommendation around the marijuana uh, revenue stream. So it's it wasn't, it was a, my feeling in that meeting last night was giving a pass to this to FY23 was not um, very acceptable to those presenting and those who were voicing their opinion from the community. And I'm seeing Kathy and Pat yeah. Your heads, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. And it, the word possible was added in at the last minute, but it was, um, uh, stretch to find a way. Um, and one one person regularly mentioned marijuana. So I had actually asked Sean on what is the revenue stream from marijuana and there are two parts of it, you know, so that we could have a focused discussion on that, Andy, if there's time in one of our meeting times in May. <laughs> so, you know, they're right now that marijuana stream is in general fees and service fees, and then there's the impact part of marijuana. But, but in any case, it's that was mentioned as a, a possible place to look at. Um, That's yeah. I see Pat to, to just uh, follow up on what you just said, and then I'll recognize Pat. I know uh, in Dorothy's hand hand is uh, up. So I, I realize that there's other people who want to speak in Bob Eggner's hand is up. As far as the uh, marijuana tax, did you, um, I have to, didn't look back uh, and I could obviously, is that listed as any part of the revenue for stream for this year or for the proposed year? Yeah, it's in our, we, uh, we budgeted 190,000 in local receipts. And that's built into the budget already. Yeah, into the the tax portion of the revenue is yes. So mm -hmm. expenditure of it is not additional money, as um, it, it would require a reduction in other parts of the budget. Right. So that tax revenue was treated like that. That excise tax was treated like our other excise tax revenues, and that it goes into the bucket that supports the overall budget this year. And what about the impact fees? Sean? So that yeah, so that is not budgeted yet, um, and we have a separate accounting of impact fees received in prior years as well, because that money we have to use for the, um, the the eligible uses. So even money we've collected last year, and I think we might have collected a little bit the fiscal year before, um, the money we've collected in prior years has gone into free cash, but we have a separate accounting of how much that is because we have to use it for those specific purposes. Um, and then the annual amount that we're getting each year that has not yet been budgeted. Um, so that is certainly up for discussion. I mean, it's all but up for discussion. Be, but, the, but, in, but the problem is, is to try and make the stretch 
of saying that the permissible uses of impact fee could go into a reparations fund. Yeah, I think there, I mean, I think there's, the there's, there's, there's sort of two questions. There's one, I think, confirming the use of municipal funds for reparations is one legal question that we have out there that we need a confirmation on. Mm -hmm. And then two is if that's if it can be done, then can the mayor the impact money be a way of doing it? Um, and so those are those are two sort of legal questions that we need responses to um, to help guide next steps. Because the impact fee was designed very, and then I'm going to go start recognizing people. The impact fee was for a very specific and limited purpose when it was created by the statute and the regulatory follow up to the statute of the Cannabis Control Commission. And uh, that was. Uh, to address the community's impacts, for example, additional policing costs or similar costs that communities were relating. Another one was, um, and I know that we had questions about this from uh, members of the school committee at one point about educational programs about uh, marijuana and the impact of marijuana and whether it has costs. Those were the, what the intent was um, yeah. when they created the impact fee system. Yeah, the host agreements lay out some specific things, and those are some of the things that um, infrastructure, um, education, mental health, those types of things were all listed. The other consideration around the impact fees, there's also some legislative um, action right now that potentially could... Uh, call into question whether we'll continue to receive those fees every year going forward. Um, so the, the agreements that we have for those fees are five-year agreements and then they have to be renewed. Um, and there has been some push by um, some constituency groups to get rid of those fees or uh, lower those fees or modify those fees. Um, and I don't have anything concrete that that's going to change anytime soon, but there is some um, some action on that. And I think it might've been Northampton that not too long ago just said they're not gonna collect them anymore. Um, you know, they did collect them to begin with and they've used that, that funding. And then I think they came out recently and said they weren't gonna collect them going forward. Um, so again, that's just, right now it's a revenue source we get each year, but it, it may not be um, permanent. Bob Hegner, you had a question. Well, yeah, I was just going to, to mention what, what Sean just said, that the um, Northampton has decided not to continue to collect that, uh, that fee. So I would expect that at some point it would not be sustainable for us to continue to collect that fee. So Dorothy? So I guess you're saying that they're not going to collect the fee because they want to keep the price of marijuana cheaper. Um, and therefore, our, our marijuana would cost more than Northampton's. But the fact is, uh, my students tell me that street marijuana is much cheaper than any of the municipal marijuana. Um, I, I, I want to make the point that um, I do not regard this as a topic of choice at this moment. Um, people were asked to respond to an issue. And they did for hour upon hour for hour, well-organized, well thought out speeches. And uh, yes, there were people that we've been hearing of for quite a while in terms of the defund the police group. But there were a lot of other people I hadn't heard of before, professionals, people who were you know, very embedded in the life of this town. And my feeling is that if we do not find a way to deliver something meaningful that we will then have absolutely made our government seem like a, a farce um, that has no relationship to the people. So I, I feel that we're at a crossroads right here. I had not expected to be here. Except I wasn't that related, to, aren't you referring to the Quest program and the Community Safety Working Group and not the reparations, no, which was I'm the second saying, discussion? I've that, no, right now the reparations, I'm talking about both groups reparations group made it very clear with it we had a we were all too tired okay we were way too tired 
but the conversation went going back and forth. Would it be next year? Would it be sometime? And the answer was no, they wanted some sign of direct action. The reparations group is the quote unquote more polite group, okay? But that doesn't mean they're not going to, um, that they don't feel as strongly about the issue. Um, and they feel that they've had a long windup on this topic, not just what's happening nationally, but remember we all got delivered the book on reparations at, at, about, was it two years ago? I have no idea of time anymore. I'm just saying, I don't think we have the luxury of saying, well, we've already made the budget, it's hard, we can't do it. We've already committed the marijuana money to other costs. I think that we were being asked to go and to look at the budget again and to find the money. Um, I felt that the program that they were, they were using some phrasing, which was, I think, relatively conservative. Um, I forget what it was, but it was um, referring to another, it wasn't all BIPOC people get reparations. It was to those who had been historically affected. Um, African, people of African heritage. That's right. And, you know, that is the, the if, if on the whole spectrum of that thing, that is something that is easier to explain to a lot of people who say, what the heck are you talking about? Because it does make some sense. I, I just feel that we have to do something. And if we don't, they don't, they're not going to care about anything we do. Then they won't, they won't vote for things we want them to vote for. They won't do anything. Um, and I don't mean just this small group. I mean, people will say, what is the point? If we've done it the right way, we have done it respectfully. When we've, you wanted facts, we gave you facts. You wanted reports, we give you reports. You wanted people's lived experience. We give you people's lived experience. And if we just say, well, it's not convenient. We've made a really nice budget and we don't have room for it now. So I, I think we have to find a way. Well, let me, let, let me let's, uh, recognize other people. I have some thoughts on it too, but I want to recognize everybody's hands up. So Lynn. Um, I actually feel that Dorothy is voicing a sense of what we heard last night uh, in a very serious way. What we heard for the first two and a half hours of the meeting was a kind of a wind up to what we're going to hear next week. And uh, what we heard for the hour or so that we discussed reparations was directly in line with what we heard for the first two and a half hours. It's that an expectation that we stop using lip service and that we do something that demonstrates our commitment. I, I don't find this easy. I, it's not that I don't feel strongly, it's that I, I know from a financial standpoint, I don't find this easy. I will also say, and in the, I, you're gonna hear frustration from me as president of the council. I've had an ongoing conversation with one member of our council wanting to bring a discussion to the council about marijuana for the last two and a half years. And I always got resistance. And we need to understand marijuana because there are 11 people on our council who were not in elected positions when all of that was developed. And so we don't really understand it. And I get, you know, we get emails about, uh, different situations and I always just have to refer to uh, someone. So I think we need to look at this before we make our recommendations on our budget. I think we need to understand the two different streams of money that come in through marijuana. And we need to understand what those uses are and not used for. I think we also need to understand whether we can legally support reparations in our budget or not. Um, I, and I think in many ways, <laughs> at a much, much different level, this is coming with uh, the same kind. I'm, I'm feeling like I need to go figure it out tomorrow. Like I had to figure out how to get mosquito on the table so we could pass it. I mean, it's this is not something to put on the shelf until 
July. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about taking this on too long. This is. Um, I'm considering as a topic not anticipated 48 hours in advance, since it was only uh, less than 12 hours in advance that we knew about this topic. On the other hand, the purpose of the open meeting law is to give notice and to have a substantial discussion of the issue to take place at a meeting that is not noticed um, uh, does make me feel uncomfortable, even though we did not anticipate it 48 hours in advance. So actually probably not going to make my own personal response as to what's been said at this point for that reason and want to uh, limit this and get it back on an agenda that's posted and let the minutes reflect please that um, this was taken up as an issue to announce to um, that was just not anticipated 48 hours for the reasons stated um i see bernie's hand is up um uh, so let's see what else we can do briefly and then uh, with uh, the understanding that we are going to have to get it onto a posted agenda for real discussion so that it's uh, notified to the public that this discussion is occurring. Um, Bernie? Um, very briefly, I, you know, I think there's, there's a certain magic that was attributed to marijuana in terms of revenue that was overstated. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that we really have to, uh, I agree with Lynn, we really have to this council really has to take a good hard look at this. I also would suggest that reparations need not be financial. We might look at other ways to, um, if we can't come up with a dollar figure right now, there might be some other ways we could do non-financial uh, in, uh, incentives or, or, or moves to, uh, to, to help people, not just simply show good faith, but to actually help people. Uh, and, and thirdly, I had really hadn't considered and I should have, uh, whether or not the town can legally do this if this violates the any aid amendment or anything like that. So my question would be, uh, are we waiting for um, the town attorney to tell us or are we waiting for Maura Healy to tell us whether reparations are a real thing? Paul? So we've had a request into the town attorney for a, a legal opinion for quite some time now. and. It's a complicated thing, and it's they just haven't completed that at this point. But they, she knows. I've talked regularly, and they know they're working. They are working on that legal opinion. Uh, well, wouldn't it be worth also contacting the attorney general's office for their opinion? Sure. That's, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, and I am just now reading all the material we got, but I don't think we should err on the side of defining reg reparations too narrowly as an individual benefit to an individual person. It could include that. It could also include, in my mind it could, but that's why I would like to have the committee set up with a charge. But if one of our schools became vacant, would we have a multicultural section with particular race and ethnic stuff, would we do programs in the schools? I don't know what else they might come up with um, as specifics, but I just wouldn't wanna get too narrow opinion on legality until we know the breadth of what could be. And, and again, I would like this to come from the group, not from me on what could be seen as part of of the response. Um, so that's all I was worried about, that we not go to a town attorney with, can we do this or that, but but some not not narrow it too much at this point. Right. I'd also be surprised if KP Law has not talked to the AG's office. Uh, the, the law firms that do this have everybody's extensions and uh, direct numbers. I still would like to hear directly from the attorney general's office. Well. Um, I really want to cut this off uh, for the reasons stated. This is not publicly noticed discussion, and we are getting fairly far into something that um, I don't want to take advantage of the 48 hour exception um, in Trump on the public's right to know we're having a discussion. But uh, Bob, your hand is up. 
I, I just have a question. Uh, is If there is any written material or any presentation materials that are available, could I get them? Are they on the, uh, are they on the website or? The, the material that was sent to the council yesterday, um, we can get that sent to the three resident okay. member committees so everybody has the same packet material. I will do that because I always uh, try and get that done at some point and I will do it on these reparations question uh, material that was sent. Uh, so I think that the presentation and discussion really sort of left from that and not wasn't about that material. Uh, so at that point, uh, in knowing we have another uh, meeting coming up, is there any, the other thing that I just want to touch on briefly is uh, we are under time squeeze with the um, 30 day rule for referral. Um, the, um, as you probably know, and if not, I'll say it again. The charter says that um, the um, budget is referred to us as a finance committee to investigate and report back to the council within 30 days of referral. It's referred on May 3rd. Um, I, Athena hasn't uh, disputed my arithmetic, so I'm assuming that 30 days after is June 2nd. And uh, that means that we need to complete our recommendations on June 1st and uh, try and have at least the core. Um, uh, what I was hoping is, is that the report on our meetings with the various departments would get encapsulated in finance committee reports and didn't have to be repeated and that the final report then had, would be able to focus solely on our recommendations and uh, that that could be uh, framed in advance but couldn't be written in advance but, uh, but so it would require a fairly quick turnaround. So that's the process um, that, com that completes this for us and uh, uh, we'll uh, have to uh, work, I'll have to work with Sean on figuring out how to add a little bit of time to do a posted agenda item to continue the discussion that we started on the additional piece that was referred to us. Any other comments, Kathy? Um, just Andy, thank you for bringing that to our attention. So one of the intense discussions we're going to have is not till the 27th um, that relates to the budget. So I think everyone you know, to the extent we come up with some ideas and that aren't just, you know, a line item here and there, um, we will have, we might, we might need to meet again, I guess is what I'm thinking that, um, it, you know, so just be anticipating, you know, wherever the discussion on the 27th goes, if the, our report is due on, due on, what did you just say, on the next Monday? Into yeah, I think we have a we have a June one meeting scheduled, which is a Tuesday, and I think it's Wednesday. I'm just getting so my it, calendar up right. Now. So that's why I'm just wondering. Do my you know my calendar is often wrong on finance now because I plug them in at the beginning of the year. So do we have a? Uh, is the eighth the eighth would be the day after the town council meeting? Do we have a meeting? I'm just asking if we need another day for a meeting after the 27th, whatever that discussion is. The eighth is CRC. Finance and CRC alternated, and they they did it. So now we're the, we're the first Tuesday. So I just have it on the wrong day, Dorothy. Is no. that what I have? Okay, so we, we do have have June first and June third is finance. But we don't have uh, we don't have it on the eighth. As I said, Mike. So we we already have a meeting scheduled for June first, is what you're saying? Yes, and June third as well. First of May. I I 
All I'm asking is what is our deadline for getting the report back and do we have time for discussion? And it sounds like the answer is yes. I think I heard the answer yes. The, wait a minute, which report are we talking about now? The report to the council. Well, if the report to the council is two 30 days after referral from the council to us, and it was referred on May 3rd, then it's June 2nd that we have to give a report. Right. So our report is due on June 2nd and June 1st is the last finance committee meeting. And that's gonna be substantially to vote recommendations. We have two meetings set up for the 27th, uh, one with the community service working group at 5.30 and a 1 p.m. meeting um, that, uh, I think encompasses um, the last pieces of the agenda, right? Um, Sean, the first Andy. meeting on the Yeah, so our next meeting's with the 20th is general government, the 27th is conservation, and planning, oh. and development, and also public health has been added to that last one. So we have a little bit less time on that last one than we initially did because of the, the rescheduling of the finance committee meeting a couple, uh, last week. Um, so public health will also be on the 27th and then we should have a little bit of time. I would think after that, probably an hour, hour and a half still. Um, but then again, we're going to have another meeting that night that starts at five 30. So it depends how many consecutive hours you want to meet for if we start at one o'clock and then we have another meeting at five 30. And of course, the other thing is, is that, um, I think we had made a decision, uh, at least to involve, uh, Lynn as council president, feeling that we need to be very um, respectful of the community service working group and that we can talk about how we're framing the report, but that we can't vote recommendations. We should not vote recommendations until we've, after we've met with the community safety working group because of the, um, the sequencing. So we are running on an extremely tight time schedule now. I have a brief question. Is, is there any way, I know the charter specifies the 30 days, but is there any way for us to legitimately ask for a, a, even a small extension on that? I have thought about that too, and um, I don't know if Lynn or Paul have a different take on it, but it's pretty specific in the in the charter. Okay. I mean, there's a specific statement, and there, I don't know that I don't think that we yeah. have the ability to ask the council to make an exception to the charter. I don't know if our uh, expert on the council who is on the charter commission will have a different opinion of asked. I think uh, the issue is to the extent that the charter is tied to the general law associated with cities. And I, I personally don't know that, but we certainly can ask. I will just point out that the council itself doesn't meet again until the 7th of June. And at that time is when we have the hearing for the capital program, the small capital program, not the big buildings. <coughs> and then we meet again on the 21st, <coughs> which is our target date to accept the budget. But we do have a meeting on, th on the 28th on case we need it mm -hmm. to accept the budget. But I think we're gonna need that meeting because for instance, last night, I had to move four items off of the agenda until this coming week as well. Andy, I don't know if this is a viable alternative, but we have a, we had a, a finance committee meeting scheduled for June 3rd. I don't know if people can meet on June 2nd. We could potentially move that meeting up a day. So you have another meeting. I mean, you'd be meeting June 1st and then June 2nd, but it would give you one more block of time to finalize the report and then send it out that evening. That's, that's what I was looking for, just, you know, 
if, if we can't move it by a week, can we move, can we have enough more time to be thinking together? Um, It is uh, availability for moving the June 3rd meeting to June 2nd. That's, I, I, I had actually, we had actually put in the June 3rd meeting, not thinking about the fact that 30 days was going to be up before we. I forgot that whole 31 days in May or thing. And, and I think that the, uh, I think that the problem that, uh, uh, that you were getting at Lynn in my recollection of the statute, and I obviously am not looking at it now, but I've read that section of the statute pretty frequently. I don't think the 30 days is in the statute. I think that was created by the Charter Commission. I think that the what it says in there is it, there's a specific number of days after the formation of the council for the town manager to submit a budget to a council or the mayor, if it's a mayor form of government. And then uh, the, the June 30th deadline for, deadline for final council action is in the statute. But the, the referral to finance committee and the 30 days to report back was a creation, I believe, of the Charter Commission. Andy, I think that you're absolutely spot on with that. And I think that we saw that happen last year. When we needed the extension, it was the state, but the extension was given for when we had to adopt a budget by, not when we had to report it back. I'll also be more than glad to check with Mandy Jo on her uh, recollection on that. In the meantime, we can also look at the municipal, the uh, state statute. But uh, I'm also available on this. Yeah, I am. I and think I can do I the think second. I am. I, I would have to get my calendar. Yep. I will make myself available, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're going to do some additional thinking about this. I, um, at this point, we do need to adjourn so that we can have. Um, because yeah, I got to have a meeting. break. We do. We do. Okay. Okay. See you. So, so um, I. I think at this point we should uh, uh, adjourn this committee meeting, and I will get back with a memo to the committee after we've after doing some investigation and some thought about the scheduling thing, so that because because we can do that by email legitimately with the open meeting law, and uh, we'll handle it by email exchange for scheduling purposes only, and uh, so. Anything else for today? If not, I'm going to keep this meeting is adjourned at um, 3.45. Thank you. Okay, thank you.